welcome to episode number 22 of Slash Tracks Action News. I'm Alex Vanover. And as you can see, I'm riding solo tonight. I'm basically Jason Derulo. So uh, if you guys don't know, Josh is uh, dealing with some serious health issues. And uh, I hope him nothing but the best and a speedy recovery. Uh, but the show must go on. So here I am at the Slash Tracks News Studio. And I'm going to be doing this episode solo. We're going by myself. I'm John Rambo on this episode. Uh, First Blood Part 2. I've got a blue stick, a large knife. I don't have any uh, local guides to help me. I have nothing. Uh, and that actually, I was referencing Rambo First Blood Part 3 right there, <laughs> or Rambo 3. But uh, anyway, I'm John Rambo for this episode, and uh, we're going to make it happen. And I want to, <laughs> the first first thing I want to do is uh, I want to apologize for not having any canned laughter available, like the 70s sitcoms used to have. So it's going to be really weird to like say something or to think something and not have uh, a reaction, but I'm going to do my very best and uh, hope Josh comes back healthy and ready to go for our episode number 23. So uh, that being said, let's get into the nice comment and mean comments of the week. It's been, it's been a while. It's been about a month since the last episode. So let's get into it. Uh, nice comment. All right, here we go. Great comments, interesting fun facts, good sports, checking out Hunt a Killer, amazing wrestling and whore talk, intriguing headlines, love the Jason Frank motivational speech, great episode. And that's from Dakugan Toskov, and that's on uh, Slash Tracks Action News episode number 21. So thank you so much, Dakugan. Uh, episode number 21 was a really personal one to Josh and I because it was the Jason David Frank tribute episode. And, uh, we like to keep the episodes as light as we possibly can, but um, it was a little heavier than the, uh, previous episodes. So it was uh, it was an honor to be able to to dedicate that show to him and to have all the slashaholics respond to it in such a really positive way. Um, it's really sad. Uh, the David Yoss just announced. I mean, YouTube just announced that uh, the new Power Rangers 30th anniversary special is actually like in the works it's like basically almost already done uh once a ranger uh david yost is in it and walter jones is going to come back as the black ranger they're going to have steve cardonis they're going to have uh all the uh, i mean the three rangers that replaced uh you know the yellow the red the black are going to be back uh karen ashley all those people even the pink ranger replacement is going to be in it uh amy joe johnson unfortunately is not going to be in it because of uh Money. Uh, she said on her Twitter that uh, she wasn't offered enough money and that she knew what she was worth. So I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, I'm aware that Austin Austin St. John, uh, who was the original Red Ranger, is uh, dealing with some legal issues. Uh, we were going to cover that story on a previous episode, but the original Red Ranger was uh, he's involved in a scandal, um, like accepting money for the covid uh you know, the PPE loans or whatever, he apparently he had a small business and he was accepting money that he didn't use for the business. So uh, this is all alleged. I don't think he's been convicted. So, you know, I, I hope that he didn't do it. And I hope he if he didn't, he's exonerated and that uh, he goes on and has a, a great future that's jailless. How about that? <laughs> no jail in, in sight for the Red Ranger, because if he goes to jail, he's definitely going to want to morph his way out of there. Um, let's get to a mean comment. Too raunchy. MST3K homage? Question mark? Nope. Exclamation point. And that's from Maniac Dortlu. And that's on Slash Tracks, episode number 24, Hellraiser Revelations. So, Maniac, uh, you're saying that we're too raunchy, but you're, you were watching uh, Hellraiser Revelations. It's a movie about two guys who go to Mexico to find prostitutes to sleep with. Uh, they talk about getting their dick wet uh, constantly throughout the film. There's a scene where one of the boys, uh, spoiler alert, is wearing the other boy's skin as like a suit. And you're watching, the, you know, that movie and enjoying it at home by yourself. And you're calling us too raunchy. So, eh, I don't know, buddy. I think, uh, I think you're, <laughs> you're trying to dig out the skeletons in uh, the Slash Tracks closet when you've got some of your own there, pal. Thank you for watching. Thank you for the comment. Thanks for helping the old algo, but you're a dick, okay? So let's get into a nice comment. Let's get into another. I need to clean my cleanse my palate from that one. Nice comment. 
had me laughing, nostalgic and crying. And that's from FF Elmer 57. And that's on Slash Tracks News number 21. So that was on the previous uh, episode of Slash Tracks News, uh, which, by the way, had 40,000 views in one day. So it had 40,000 views in 24 hours. Uh, I think it's at around 64,000 views total um, as it sets right now. I think uh, 40,000 is definitely the, the record for views in one day. And I want to say thank you to Hunt a Killer, uh, the company that sponsored the previous episode, for taking a chance on Josh and I and uh, deciding to sponsor the episode. And I was really happy to see that we could uh, pay them back for the confidence they had in us. And they got some views and we got their product out there. And they have unbelievable uh, horror based uh, mystery, murder mystery, crime board games. Um, I've got the Blair Witch Project like expansion pack kit that they sent me. So if I ever have a party at my house, I mean, everybody gets their own board game. It's going to be incredible. I'm kind of saving it so when Josh and I actually do get to hang out in person, we can play it. Uh, you know, with Sister Evil, Brother Evil, <laughs> Mother Evil, uh, we can all play it together. So. That'll be a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, big thanks to Hunt a Killer for sponsoring the previous episode. And uh, I was glad we could, you know, help him out and get him some views and some eyeballs on their product. Uh, let's get into the last nice comment of uh, the episode. <clears throat> okay. The role playing pitch meeting part about Hot Pockets was funny as fuck. You should do more of those. And that's from Prene420. And that's on episode uh, Slash Tracks News number 21. And he's referring to the uh hot pocket pants so hot pockets is getting into the business of not just food anymore they're going to do pants so they have special pockets that you can put your hot pockets in and uh keep your hot pockets warm like napoleon dynamite did with his tater tots uh in case you don't want to eat all of your hot pockets at once or you want a hot pocket uh, to go you can put them in your hot pockets pants uh and josh and i uh josh <laughs> and i role played a pitch meeting where we, you know, I was like trying to sell him on the idea of these Hot Pockets pants, or he was trying to sell me on it, on how great of an idea it was, or how Hot Pockets needs to expand uh, their empire. Um, I don't know if Hot Pockets pants are going to catch on. I saw something uh, recently. McDonald's has this contest where they have this ultimate gaming chair, and it has a like a drink holder, but it's a fry holder. It's like grease resistant. It's like really slick looking. Uh, it's black and yellow. It's got the McDonald's colors. Um, there's like a warmer for some of your food, I guess, that you can. It's one of one. This is There's only one of these chairs. And there's some sort of contest they're hosting uh, in Europe or, you know, Wales and stuff uh, where if you win this contest, you can win this chair. So that sounds incredible. But. I'm telling you right now, cop be, being copied is the sincerest form of flattery. And someone's going to see that photo of that one of one chair. And I guarantee someone's going to Frankenstein one in their garage. I promise you that. So I'll be on the lookout for that. If you slash Alex haven't seen that chair, you should definitely Google the McDonald's gaming chair. It's freaking hilarious looking. Um, that being said, before we get into fun facts, I want to plug the show and the channel a little bit. So the next episode of slash tracks uh, is set to be the Nightmare on Elm Street 2009 remake uh, with Jackie Earl Haley. So unfortunately, it was supposed to have been done and filmed uh, like a month ago. But Josh had his situation and uh, definitely got pushed back. But I talked to Josh this morning. He said he's feeling much better. Uh, he says that he hopes that it continues to keep progressing and getting better. But hope you and that he could have a chance to uh, record the riff for uh, the Nightmare on Elm Street remake sometime early next week. So let's keep our fingers crossed for that because that episode, we're going to tear that thing apart. And Josh has probably got some pent up uh, energy and uh, anger that he needs to unleash on that piece of shit film because that is an abomination to the franchise. And that cannot be the last time we see Freddy Krueger on, on the silver screen. I'm tired of it. Uh, every other Horror franchise is getting some sort of new iteration. Uh, they're making a Saw 10 right now. Uh, the Conjuring is constantly getting new films. Uh, I don't know. Just the Terrifier just got a brand new film that blew up in the theaters on a tiny budget. I want to see Freddy Krueger on the big screen soon. And I would prefer it to be Robert England. If it's not, let's get somebody other than Jackie Earl Haley because I just kept thinking about how tiny he was. I mean, when Josh and I riffed 
uh, Halloween Resurrection and talked about Tiny Michael Myers. That is Tiny Freddy. That's uh, Freddy on Freddy on the shelf. Okay, so if you're doing a holiday calendar and you got Freddy for December, it's Freddy on a shelf, boys and girls, and you're putting his little ass on the shelf and you're hiding him around your house in different uh, places in your kitchen, in your bathroom, in your nooks, in your crannies. That's the only thing Jackie Earl Haley was good for. Uh, I don't like the film. I, the only scene I really enjoyed in that film, and this is a spoiler alert for when we review the film for Slash, Track, <laughs> Slash Tracks Reviews, because the first film series we're doing is Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, I didn't like the casting. I didn't like the film. But the only scene I actually really enjoyed, and Josh agrees with me, was when uh, uh, Freddy kills one of the kids and he's like, hey, the human brain can uh, still is still alive for another like 30 seconds or 60 seconds. So they had more time to play. So he's already dead. He already killed this kid. And he's continuing to torture him uh, because the human brain is alive for another 60 seconds. So that was that was a really innovative and pretty cool scene. Um, I wish they had done more of that. Uh, but you know what? You can't hit a home run every time. So that's life. And, I'm, you know, just do your best. OK, they, that movie made a lot of money, though. So it didn't do all bad. Let's get into some fun facts. The average person will spend about 92 days on the toilet in a lifetime. 92 days. That's on average. I wouldn't have graduated high school if it wasn't for the toilet. Uh, I did a lot of reading on the toilet. I did a lot of reading in the bathtub. Uh, drank a lot of sodas in the bathtub while I was reading. Uh, I, was, I was famous for just destroying the household's water bill because I would, <laughs> I would sit in the tub till the water got cold and then I would refill that son of a bitch. So my family... Uh, probably happy that I took a lot of baths because I was getting my homework done, but at the same time, probably pissed because, uh, I was getting a lot of homework done because I was in there forever and I was refilling the tub and, uh, hot water doesn't heat itself. Uh, here's a, <laughs> here's a second fun fact. Funeral homes use spiked contact lenses to keep your eyes closed when you die. That's absolutely terrifying. That is a crazy image. Uh, so I guess your muscles, you're dead. So there's nothing. I mean, you need to use energy and muscles and stuff to close your eyeballs. So trying to close them when you're dead, everything loosens up, I'm sure, after rigor mortis is set in. Because rigor mortis doesn't last forever. So your eyes are <laughs> closed with uh, spiked contact lenses. That is terrifying. How do, how do people not see the little spikes holding the eyelids closed when they go visit their loved ones? I know back in the 1800s in the Old West, they just put silver dollars on top of their eyes to keep their eyes closed. So that, if, as if death wasn't horrifying enough, there's another little tidbit to think about. Um, here's another fun fact. If you enter a body of water to escape a swarm of angry wasps, they will wait for you to reemerge from the water so they can continue stinging you. So these, these wasps, have, uh, they have evolved, boys and girls. Uh, you cannot hide from wasps, apparently. So if you jump in the water, like in the old cartoon shows, you're being chased by a bunch of bees and hornets and shit, and you jump in the water and you think you're safe, nah, -uh. no, you're not, bud. Uh, unless you have hot pocket pants on uh, that are hot as hell, and you can use those as some sort of diversion uh, so they can go after the hot pocket to eat that. I don't know if hornets or wasps eat hot pockets, but they're going to sting your ass. They're waiting for you. They're going to set up a little bee lawn chair and they're going to wait till you get out, and then they're going to get your ass. That's more terrifying than spiked contact lenses, I think. If they sting you enough, you're going to be able to experience both, because you're going to be dead. Uh, you're going to be pulling a, a My Girl situation. You're going to be Macaulay after that one. By the way, My Girl, available on the, like almost every streaming option uh, <laughs> platform right now for free, and my girlfriend absolutely loves that movie, and it's like, Oh, they have my girl. And it's like, oh, yeah, they had it, you know, yesterday, too, when we went by it. And you said the same thing. Same thing with Dennis the Menace when you see that. And also when you see any Home Alone, you have the same response. It's like you've seen five movies in your life. The Little Rascals is also included in that. <clears throat> in 2009, a set of identical twins in Germany were arrested for a jewelry heist. DNA evidence proved that at least one was at the crime scene. But it was impossible to prove which individual was guilty. So both were acquitted. So one of them did commit the, the jewel heist, but the, they couldn't prove which one it was. This is next level criminal mastermind shit right here. They could, this is a get out of jail free card forever. 
they could just continually do this. Well, I mean, unless they get caught on video and they're both doing it. But uh, this is sister sister stuff. This is Nikki and Brie Bella shit. This is twin magic. This is beautiful. Um, can you imagine being the other twin that didn't do it and she's innocent and she's like, well, thank God, uh, thank the Lord that you didn't. Uh, I didn't have to go to prison because I didn't do shit. But I've read that identical twins uh, know what the other one is thinking or feeling or they feel some sort of energy or whatever. So the other one should have known what the, the other one was going to be a robber and tried to stop the other one. So she's kind of to blame for that one anyway. So whatever. What are you going to do? They're both to blame. Um, before we get into the next fun fact, I want to plug the channel real quick. If you are a sponsor and you like the content we do here at Slash Tracks Network, if you are a fan of the show and you want to write us and ask us a question, if you have you know, an idea for the show, you have an idea, you just want to ask Josh and I a question, you want to wish Josh uh, best wishes, you hope he gets well soon, um, if you're anything, any reason at all, get a hold, go ahead and get a hold of us at slashtracks2020 at gmail.com. Uh, we read every email, we get back to you as soon as we possibly can. Uh, I know that some people have submitted uh, their writing for Josh to narrate on the channel. Uh, if you are one of those people that have submitted something and Josh hasn't replied yet, don't worry about it. Josh isn't feeling that great right now. He's aware that it's there. When he feels better and he's up to it, he'll get to it and he'll get back to you. Uh, but don't be shy to submit more things for him to narrate on the channel. Uh, he's just not feeling so great right now, but we will get to it. And once again, if you're a business or a company or anybody and you feel like uh, this is the kind of content you'd like to partner with and you think that we could help each other out, go ahead, get in, get a hold of us at slashtracks2020 at gmail.com. Enough of the business. Let's get back into the fun facts. American was the official language of Illinois from 1923 to 1969. American. Not English. American. Why don't you speak American? You speak American? I speak American over here. That makes me think that the people in Illinois are the most... I, I mean, they're not even from the South. They're like in the Midwest. But that sounds like something that a hillbilly would say or a redneck or someone that's not educated. And I'm not saying hillbillies and rednecks are, are universally not educated. I'm just saying the stereotype. Uh, that sounds like something an idiot would say. These people don't speak American. It's like, good Lord. And that was an official language of, of Illinois was American. I don't even understand that. That's like one of the craziest. There was a law one time where it was like, you can't date an ugly, you can't be an ugly girl and walk out on the street in like some such and such state. There's so many obsolete laws and rules that were created that are super absurd. Uh, if you guys are ever bored and you want to have a laugh, you should look up uh, crazy laws that still are on the books. They're not enforced, but there's a bunch of them. I think we should probably do that as a segment one day on one of the future episodes of slash tracks because they're really really interesting you could probably make a calendar out of it and have one for all 365 days plus a leap year um anyway let's get into another fun fact reincarnation is forbidden in china without the government's permission so don't you even dare think about coming back to life as anything you're gonna have to get permission from china's government you're gonna have to get it signed and uh you know, I don't even notate it. What's the word you say? Like uh, notarized by at least two or three government officials. They're going to have to have a little talk about it. Maybe you were a real shitter in the previous life and they don't want you coming back as anything. Or maybe they do want you coming back and it's going to be as like a toad or a wasp or a toilet seat or something like that. So you're going to have to get written permission if you want to be reincarnated, reincarnated in China. Last fun fact of the episode. Not only do insects feel pain, but they can also suffer from chronic pain after recovering from an injury. So insects do feel pain. So you're an asshole for stepping on them or trying to kill them. Uh, and they don't just feel pain. They suffer from lingering pain from issues that, that resulted from you being a jerk and hitting them with the paper uh, or, the, or the magazine on the back of the toilet seat. Or maybe I was doing it when I was doing homework, when I was on the toilet for a third of my life. <laughs> Um, that is absolutely nuts to think of a bug, like with a chronic, chronic back issue or cause there's no bug doctors. 
There's no bug physicians that are putting casts on these poor bugs. I mean, they have like eight legs. Some of them have more than that. Can you imagine if you saw a bug just out in the wild with like two or three casts on their legs and like a big brace on their back or like a big uh, thing on their head? They got to. <laughs> it's just crazy. These poor bugs, their their ter- their lives are bad enough. Like if a human being sees them in their house, they're dead. And if they don't die, they're going to be dealing with chronic pain forever. What a shitty existence. I saw some sort of stat that like if every spider in the world uh, decided to work together and rise up, they could kill all of humanity within like a week. So maybe we should just all do ourselves a favor and maybe not just, you know, decide not to kill all these, you know, swat these bugs. Let's just do the sweet, gentle thing and get yourself a glass and a piece of paper. Let it crawl in there and let the bastard outside. Okay, it'll help humanity because if they decide to rise up and kill us, it's going to help us on that end. But it's also going to help bugs because they're not going to have to go to the doctor and have some sort of back surgery that they can't have because there are no uh, bug physicians. All right, let's get into Slash Tracks Sports. All right, now this, this, this is crazy. In Michael Jordan's last season, so when he was with the Washington Wizards in his second comeback, at the age of 40, he played all 82 games and averaged over 37 minutes. That would actually lead the NBA right now. So Michael Jordan, in his second comeback at the age of 40, if he played right now in today's NBA, would lead the NBA in minutes played. That's ridiculous. That is next level work ethic, grit, determination. They don't make them like they used to. Just insane. I'm a huge Michael Jordan fan, and that just makes me an even bigger fan of his. He's the GOAT. Uh, Second is probably, I mean, I don't know. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D. Uh, But Jordan, in my opinion, is the GOAT. He was never chasing stats to begin with. He was chasing championship rings, and and he had this drive and determination to be the best. The the only person I've ever seen that even came close to that mindset and that work ethic was Kobe Bryant. Uh, When he was a Laker, I I couldn't stand him because I'm a Blazers fan, and he just whipped our ass every time that we played Los Angeles. He would just destroy us. But the older I got and the more I kind of just dug into his career, into his mindset, and kind of peeled back the layers of the onion, uh, I realized what a -a one-of-a-kind person he was. He tried to maximize every bit of talent that he had and every bit of – athletic ability that he had and he came damn close to doing it he's like the david goggins of basketball players uh if you guys ever want to see a really neat documentary or something that's really interesting and and that kind of like shows kobe bryant's mindset and work ethic you should uh look up the redeem team on netflix it's about the olympic team in i think 2012 that uh came back and won the gold medal and kobe bryant was a big reason for that uh just shows his mindset and his mentality compared to the other players it's just ridiculous like they were all at a party like the night before and they were coming back to the hotel at like three or four o'clock in the morning and Kobe Bryant walked past them in the hotel lobby and he was just drenched in sweat. Um, and they were like, where the hell have you been? And he's like, well, just got, just got done exercising for the last like three hours. Like he went on like a hundred mile bike ride on like the Peloton bike that didn't even exist back then, but like whatever, yeah, the echo chamber bike or something. He put in like a hundred miles while they were off drinking and partying and doing the two step. Uh, just next level, just ridiculous. Kobe Bryant's the man. Michael Jordan's the man. Can't believe that he'd lead the league uh, in minutes played right now if he <laughs> he was still around. That's crazy. Um, here's the next sports story. Three players have scored 70 plus points in an NBA game in the last 25 seasons. So only three. All three of them are shooting guards, and all three of them were drafted as the 13th pick. 13th pick in their respective drafts. So the 13th pick, you're a pretty good player, but you're not. They don't believe in you quite as much as the players above you. You're kind of like an unknown. You're not an all-around player, I guess. When you're, There's still some question marks about you. Um, those three players, Kobe Bryant, who we just talked about, Devin Booker of the Suns, and Donovan Mitchell, who plays for the Cavaliers now. He was a Utah Jazz player last season. Uh, all those players, 13th pick in their draft, and they've all dropped over 70-plus points in a game. In the last, they're the only ones to do it in the last 25 years. So there's a lot to be said about being overlooked, Um, especially if you're already competitive and you are driven. uh, If you're already like kind of like you feel slighted about something in your life, 
you don't need any more motivation to show somebody uh, what you're really made of. And if you're picked later in the draft, you know, it's it's no coincidence to me that the later play, the players picked later in the draft are the ones popping off for over 70 plus points and these amazing performances because they just have something to prove. Uh, they've got a chip on their shoulder. Some, I mean, Tom Brady was drafted in the 12th round. He's got seven Super Bowl rings. Um, he still remembers every player that was drafted in front of him. That's just insanity. It's like he's never going to stop. He's got this thing where it's like, I'm going to show everybody that you were all absolutely stupid for not picking me. And I think uh, his mission was accomplished there. And, uh, you know, Kobe Bryant definitely uh, showed everybody they were wrong for not <laughs> selecting him number one in the 1996 draft. What? A, or I think 97, no, it's 96 or 97 draft. But the 12 players selected before him, none of those guys had anything on Kobe Bryant. Uh, Devin Booker and Donovan Mitchell definitely putting in work. Uh, Devin Booker's like next level offensive talent. And Donovan Mitchell is right behind him. So those guys are well on their way to greatness. Uh, here's another sports story. In 1970, Puma paid Pele, the great Brazilian soccer player who just passed away. So rest in peace, Pele. They paid him $120,000 to tie his shoes on camera. And this was at the 1970 World Cup. So they're like, hey, Pele, you're wearing our shoes. We need a camera shot of you bending down and tying the shoes with like the Puma logo, you know, out front. They gave him $120,000 in 1970, which is probably, you know, in today's money, one, two million dollars tied to shoes. That is insanity, man. Uh, I wish I could get that kind of money for tying my shoes. I wish I was good enough to do anything for $120,000 for a full year. Uh, that's he made $120,000 tying his shoes. Loop, swoop, and pull, baby. That's ins- that's crazy. Uh, he did the bunny ears and got $120,000. That's fucking nuts. Uh, and also that same World Cup, Pele helped Brazil win the World Cup that year too. So got $120,000 for tying his shoes, and he also won the fucking World Cup all in the same year. Great year for Pele. Uh, here's, <laughs> here's another sports story. Conor McGregor had 14 fights in his eight-year UFC career. So Conor McGregor, super popular. He kind of retires quite a bit uh, on and off. He's all over the place. He's lost more than he's won recently. Uh, In eight years, 14 fights. Mike Tyson, uh, two-time heavyweight champion, uh, (laughs) controversial to say the least. Some consider him to be the best boxer of all time when he was in his prime, probably like unbeatable. I know that Joe Rogan uh, really liked prime Mike Tyson. Uh, Tyson had great head movement. He could move. Uh, he almost went parallel from his waist to the bottom of the, the mat. I mean, he would like go down and like have incredible head movement and body movement. And he was just insane. But anyway, uh, Mike Tyson had 15 fights in 1985 alone. So Conor McGregor, eight, 14 fights in his eight-year career, didn't even win all of them. Mike Tyson, 1985, had 15 fights, won all of them, probably all by knockout. Uh, just a different, different time, different mentality, different mindset, different everything. Um, Joe Lewis had the great world champion from the 20s and 30s. Joe Lewis had the bum of the month club. So when he was the heavyweight champion of the world, he fought one guy a month. He's defending his title every month. So I don't know. There's a lot to be said for ring rust, too. I think that if you're fighting more regularly and more frequently, it's easier to stay in ring shape. The last thing you want to do is to get fat in between fights or, or lose your rhythm or lose your anything that makes it go for you. And the longer you're out of doing something, the bigger chance you have of losing your momentum and, you know, losing a match. So I think the more you're in a ring, the better. Uh, and here's the last sports story of the episode. July 16th, 2018. Shaq had a tweet. He had just <laughs> he just bought a brand new yacht. Shaq says, what should I name her? Uh, From Shaq, hashtag my new toy. And this was on Twitter on July 16th, 2018. Andy Young in the comments (laughs) responds, call it free throw so you won't ever sink it. So greatest, greatest comment ever in a Shaq tweet was not by Shaq, but by Andy Yang. And uh, he said to call his new new yacht uh, free throw, so the yacht would never sink. Because Shaq was notoriously bad for free throws. There, he was so bad at free throws that other teams had a defense called the Hack a Shaq, where Shaq would get the ball and they wouldn't even let him dunk or shoot a layup or anything. They would just foul him and put him on the free throw line because they knew he was going to miss both or at least miss one. 
So they just have guys on their team that had fouls. It's like, you got six fouls, get in there. You're the guard Shaq, foul the shit out of him. Okay, you're done. You fouled out. Get another guy in there. Start fouling Shaq. Hack a Shaq. Uh, yeah, his yacht should be named free throw. That's phenomenal. Uh, let's get into Josh, mine, a lot of the Slashaholics out there, their favorite, uh, part of the show. Let's get into Slash Tracks Wrestling. Uh, Cody Rhodes, the American Nightmare, has officially declared himself for the 2023 Men's Royal Rumble. Now, Cody Rhodes, if you guys have been following wrestling lately or the show, Slash Tracks News... We love Cody Rhodes here, and he had an amazing match with Seth Rollins. Uh, he competed in, I believe it was a Hell in a Cell match with a torn pec or a, t- or a torn delt or maybe both. His chest and his shoulder were completely black and blue, and he had a five-star match uh, with a torn pec. Uh, it's incredible. Cody Rhodes is a phenomenal story. He was stardust uh, before he left for AEW. He, I mean, he was mid-carter for life. And then he went to AEW, uh, created his own little gimmick, uh, got over with the fans, uh, came back to WWE, and now he's a main event level superstar. And I love to see people, I love seeing people rise up to the challenge. I love seeing people do more than what other people think they can do. And Cody Rhodes is an inspiration, uh, and he should be an inspiration to more than just wrestling fans. He should be an inspiration to everybody in life that just because somebody says you uh, can't do something, it doesn't mean anything. If you work hard enough and you grind and you believe in yourself and you keep tinkering, eventually, if you throw enough shit at the wall, something's going to stick. So just keep your head above water. Keep working hard. Be like Cody Rhodes. I am super excited. Um, I just saw that The Rock, I had heard a rumor that The Rock was going to be at the Royal Rumble and they were like maybe going to have him win it uh, and then face Roman Reigns for the title at WrestleMania. Uh, apparently the rock's not in ring shape, so that's not going to happen. Or maybe they're, maybe they're just saying that. So he's a surprise, uh, shows up at WrestleMania, but they're, they're pretty much saying, according to Dave Meltzer, it's not going to happen. He's not in ring shape. I'm, I'm actually happy to hear that because it means Cody Rhodes has a chance to win the Royal rumble and maybe, uh, have a chance to main event WrestleMania and maybe even win the belt. And, uh, we talked about on a previous episode, Josh and I, that, Cody Rhodes is uh, petitioning to bring back the winged eagle belt if he wins it because he brought back the old intercontinental belt design. Uh, So if he won the belt, I would love to see the winged eagle belt back at least for a little bit because that belt was gorgeous. Um, Let's get into the next wrestling story. On January 16th, 35 years ago, on WWF Superstars of Wrestling, the WWF at the time, not WWE, because back in the old days it was WWF, announced that Hulk Hogan had agreed to put up his WWF title against Andre the Giant in an event that would be shown live on NBC in February. So February of that year. The main event attracted over 33 million viewers. So I think this was pre-Saturday night's main event. This might have been like the first Saturday night's main event. And it was the rematch from WrestleMania 3 where Hogan slammed the Giant retained his title at the Pontiac Silverdome. They set attendance records for an indoor, uh, you know, event for a wrestling event, or maybe just an indoor event in general, I think at the time. Um, yeah. And then they had the rematch and Hogan actually lost because they had the, the twin referee, Dave and Earl Hebner, uh, Bobby, the brain and Andre, uh, had the twin referee come in and do a fast count. Hogan lost the belt. And then it led to the, the tournament at WrestleMania four, where macho man ended up winning the belt from million dollar man in the finals. So, but 33 million viewers for a wrestling event on TV. If WWE had an event with 33 million viewers, they only get like 1.3 million viewers per Raw. I mean, if they're lucky. Some, they were having Raws that were drawing like 0.8. They were getting like 800,000 viewers. This thing did 33 million viewers. That just tells you how over wrestling was in the 80s. How big of a draw Hulk Hogan was. How big of a draw Andre the Giant was. I saw, I saw a photo on Twitter the other day. Andre the Giant doing karaoke before WrestleMania 6. Uh, I, think I'm gonna, I think I either shared it on my Twitter. So if you guys don't follow me on Twitter, I'm Vandollar15 uh, on Twitter. So I always post weird wrestling stuff or weird wrestling photos or just funny stuff. Um, but there, there's, a, there's a photo of Andre the Giant singing karaoke before WrestleMania 6. And the question was... What was he singing? Uh, so what would you? What do you guys think Andre the Giant was singing uh, at karaoke that night? What do you think? A little Jim Croce, a little Elton John, 
Uh, was he doing some Benny and the Jets? What what was he singing? Uh, Operator? I would love, if they had some sort of video back then, I would have loved to see it. I mean, you, <laughs> back in the old days, though, you didn't have camera phones. You had to bring out a freaking camcorder. And the only people who had camcorders back in the you know 80s were your rich uncle who didn't get along with your mother. So you didn't really have access to a camcorder uh, very often. Um, but yeah, 33 million viewers. Hogan lost the belt. Didn't lose it clean, of course, because back then he lost cleanly to nobody. Uh, except for Ultimate Warrior, WrestleMania Six. Uh, yeah, Hogan didn't do the job for many people, but, uh, that's a big deal. That is a huge deal. Anyway, the title was vacated because they showed that, uh, they had a fake referee, uh, aid in Andre the Giants title win. And, uh, yeah, then because Hogan was, wasn't Hogan going to go, he was going to go film No Holds Barred, I think. And then he came back at WrestleMania five later on and won the belt for Macho when the mega powers exploded. So, uh, Hogan knew he was getting the belt back anyway, so whatever was good for Hogan was good for business, I guess. Um, here's another story, and this is this is like brand new, like breaking news sort of deal. Uh, Vince McMahon is back at the office uh, at Titan Towers. He's back in Connecticut at the office, uh, and he's suggesting changes. So Vince, you know, was unceremoniously removed after all the allegations of sexual misconduct uh, and the. The pay the payoffs he was making to the women making these uh, hush money, basically hush money to paralegals and stuff that he was sleeping with in the office. Uh, well, Vince is back. Um, when he initially came back, the company line was he wouldn't be involved in day to day affairs and management would remain unchanged. Well, like two days later, his daughter, Stephanie, resigned from her role as co-CEO. And uh, so the only CEO now is Nick Khan. So he's in charge of the whole deal there. Uh Triple H is in charge of creative and Nick Khan is kind of in charge of the business side. So his daughter's gone two days later after Vince came back and word is leaked that Vince is already suggesting uh, changes, not only, you know, business wise to the board, to everything. Uh, Triple H had a meeting with the talent at, at a SmackDown a week or two ago and stated that he would remain the person in charge of creative. Uh, he noted Vince could make suggestions and, but Vin, and he also said that Triple H, him, you know, he said he already talks, to other people about creative and about changes and tweaks to the show already. So if Vince is putting his two cents in, it's no different than the other people doing it. So uh, it looks like Triple H is trying to put a nice spin on it. Uh, I can't, I I can't imagine that Triple H would be excited that Vince is back uh, and is already wanting to change management. And uh, want, you know, it's only a matter of time before Vince. You know, hey, hey, Paul, why don't you come over here? I'm thinking about bringing back somebody. You know, we got the big 30th anniversary Raw. Why don't we bring back, uh, you know, Nails or somebody or or Bastion Booger or, or let's put the belt back on Hogan or something. Uh, you know, Vince, uh, I don't know. It's not a good idea. You know, uh, like how, do, how does how does Triple H feel about that? Because, you know, Vince is Vince is going to start making, you know, creative change. It's It's Vince. He's back for a reason there. He's saying he's back to help sell the company. But if he was back to sell the company, why the hell is he trying to make changes to the to the management already? If he if, if he doesn't think he's going to stick around for a while, because why would it matter? He's going to sell it anyway. So what does it matter who's on the board? It, the whole thing seems a little weird to me. It seems like Vince has got some sort of plan to uh, he's, he's performing a coup on his own business because he's the majority stakeholder or stockholder because uh, of the class B stock, because his class B stock is worth more, way more than class A stock. And the only reason I know that is because I've heard other people <laughs> explain that to me because I'm not really a stock uh, genius, but Vince is. Vince knew all along what he was doing. And uh, Vince is a very, Vince has got a big ego. Uh, he, Vince is not going to go down without a fight. And I can't imagine that Vince was having a very good time watching Triple H have success uh, by being in charge of creative without him. I'm sure that just drove him up the wall. And I bet you Vince was like super pissed that Triple H was bringing back all the NXT guys, all the former wrestlers that Vince cut because of budget cuts that Vince didn't want. Vince is notoriously, uh, he, he has no patience for wrestlers that don't immediately get over or don't fit his uh, vision of a wrestler, what they should look like, what they should act like. Vince loves the big jacked guys. Uh He's always been like that. So if you're if you're not a Vince guy, he's going to get rid of you. And if you're super over and popular, he'll deal with you till you're not anymore. And then he'll try to get rid of you. Or you'll be stuck in the IC US title uh, division for the rest of your life, like Cesaro was. Uh, who God knows. But anyway, Vince is, I think this is only a matter of time. I think this is kind of like the first 
little rumblings. It's like Vince is back in the office. Okay, now there's management's changing. Okay, now Vince is kind of like talking to Triple H about creative ideas. Okay, now Triple H is fired. Okay, now, now Vince is back in charge of creative. Okay, now Vince, now now they're not even going uh, public anymore. Now they're, they're just going to be a private company. It's like now Vince is totally in charge again. It's like, I think this is just only a matter of time before Vince somehow is in charge, full charge, full power of everything. I heard that when the rumor came out that Vince was going to, like, WWE was going to sell to uh, the Saudis, that Vince, well, like, the rumor was that Vince was going to sell, uh, WWE was going to go private, not public again, not not uh, be, you know, traded on the stock market anymore, and that the Saudis were going to put Vince in control of creative and everything. So Vince was going to get money, billions of dollars from the sale, and Vince was also going to... Uh, be in charge again of the company. So that's like a best case scenario for Vince. But I just can't imagine Vince not actually owning it. I, I feel like Vince would have a hard time answering to anybody, even if he wasn't actually answering to anybody. What do you guys think about that? Do you think Vince being back in the office is a good thing? Or do you think it's a bad thing? Uh, let us know in the comments right below. Also, uh, don't forget to write us at slash tracks 2020 at gmail.com. If you like the show, if you like what we're talking about, if you're a company, if you're a business and you think you'd like to partner up with us, maybe sponsor the show, give us an email at slash tracks 2020 at gmail.com. Uh, you can also, for all the fans out there, the slashaholics, if you want to be a Patreon member and, uh, you want to help support the show, you can join the Patreon, uh, for as low as a dollar, dollar a month. Anything helps. Josh has got some serious health issues right now. I, you know, we both have full-time jobs. We both have families. We both have lives. Uh, any little bit helps. It'll help us be able to make the show better, make the content better. It'll help us uh, in a multitude of ways. It hopefully put out more content uh, more regularly. But even if we get no new Patreon members, I'm making a personal guarantee that we are going to be way more consistent and way better about putting out content because... You know, it's just it's super important that that we're more consistent with the product and with the show. So I apologize for not being more consistent. You know, everybody's busy, yada, yada, yada. It's excuses. It's BS. I'm going to be better. And I'm promising the Slash of Hawks that Josh and I are going to be better. So be on the lookout for a lot of new content coming out. Uh, let's get into the next wrestling story. A video has re has been released of Lex Luger walking out with the WWE Championship belt before WrestleMania 10 on an episode of WWF Superstars. Now Vince uh wanted allegedly wanted to study the crowd's reaction to Luger with the belt. Um th now if this was on an episode of WWF Superstars, they must not have actually aired it on the episode. They must have like filmed it and then it was just like kept it dark they never actually showed it to the people on the actual show because i never saw this and luger didn't win the belt ever the only time luger ever even came close to winning the belt was when he beat yokozuna at SummerSlam, and he celebrated like he won the belt but he won on like a count out against yokozuna <laughs> but he celebrated like he was bret hart at wrestlemania 10 like he was celebrating like he won the belt like luger had no idea that you the belt didn't change hands uh, unless you pin the guy or submitted him, it was bizarre. Uh, but apparently, they 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 paraded Lex Luger out there with the belt before WrestleMania 10, uh, and announced him as the champion. The video is awkward. The crowd doesn't know how to react to it. They're confused. Um, there's no context to it. It's just Luger with the belt. Uh, previous to this, he's not the champion. Uh, there's going to be a three-way uh, match. You know, three matches. At WrestleMania 10, you know, Luger versus Yoko, and then the winner of that versus Brett. So there's, well, two matches or whatever, but this is bizarre. Uh, the crowd did not like it. They were confused. Uh, and it's kind of ridiculous that Vince would even base, if he was going to put the belt on Luger based on this reaction, because the crowd had no idea what the hell was even going on. And at that point, Luger was being shoved down our throats. It was like the Roman Reigns deal before he became uh, the, the gimmick he is now. Um, it was ridiculous. Nobody wanted it. It was like Vince is trying to make this guy the next Hulk Hogan. Here he is, and I'm going to shove him down your fucking throats. It didn't work. And also, the first thought I had when I saw this video was like, the Lex Luger music, that stupid USA, dun, 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 or whatever, like, that music did him no favors. He needed to have something that was cool and edgy. Not this, it was almost like American doink music. It was bull, it was stupid. Uh, but yeah, if you guys haven't seen this video of Lex Luger coming out with the belt, you guys should definitely 
uh, click that into the Google machine or the YouTube and uh, try to find that. Lex Luger before WrestleMania 10 with the belt. It's bizarre. Uh, here's the last wrestling story of the night. On January 21st, 33 years ago, Hulk Hogan won his first of two back-to-back WWF Royal Rumble matches. So Hulk, Hulkster, Hulk Hogan won the Royal Rumble in 91 uh, and 90. So <laughs> I think 90, 90 he beat Earthquake, or in 91 he beat Mr. Perfect. But I never understood, even as a kid, why Hogan was in these Royal Rumbles, because he was the champion. So why is Hogan in the Royal Rumble uh, in the first place, he should have been in a match, like the main event, uh, defending his belt. Why is he in the Royal Rumble? And this is, 92 was the first Royal Rumble where the winner would be the champion uh, or have a shot at the champion at WrestleMania. I never understood why they put Hogan in the actual Royal Rumble. And then they had him win it both times. It, it made no sense to me, even as like a seven and eight year old. I loved seeing him win, but the booking was absolutely bizarre. It seems like he would have had Hogan in his own match later on, like a singles match or a tag team match. You could have some sort of other angle going on to promote the show and then use the Royal Rumble to get a lower carded guy over with the fans. So you create an even bigger star. Was that Hogan just saying, you know, hey, brother, like I'm winning the Rumble. Like if I'm going to be the Royal Rumble, I'm going to win this thing. Like I don't even understand why they did that. What do you guys think about that? Was that just Hogan being Hogan or was that uh, Vince being in love with Hogan or they just didn't trust anybody else to win it? I, I don't understand because the Royal Rumble didn't even have there was no reason to win it. You didn't even get a trophy. It was like, why are we even having this? Like it made no it made no sense. I, I still don't get it. In the Survivor Series, since we're bitching about old gimmicks of pay-per-views, why did they want to win these Survivor Series matches so much? They're not getting tag team title match uh, shots later on. They're not getting IC belt shots. Nothing. No number one contender. Nothing. Like, I, I wish I could go back in a time machine and talk to the booking committee about some of these decisions because they don't make sense. Who the hell cares? I guess for personal satisfaction and personal, like, I'm going to win every match I'm in sort of deal. I don't I don't understand that. But what a, whatever. Um, let's get into, uh, Slash Tracks Horror. Let's get into segment number five. But first, first I'm going to take a sip of Mountain Dew because I haven't shut up for the last, like, 40 minutes. <clears throat> All right. First <laughs> news story of Slash Tracks Horror. <clears throat> On January 6, 2006, 16 years ago, Eli Roth's Hostel was released in theaters. Now, I saw Hostel in the theaters when it came out. And uh, I hadn't really seen anything like it before. I mean, I saw Saw 2 when it came out, uh, when the gal fell in the pit of used needles. Uh, that was like kind of like torture porn almost to me. It was like, it was gruesome. Um, but Hostel was all a totally different breed of cat. Like these three guys are backpacking throughout Europe and they stay in this hostel and these two girls they meet at the hostel want to take them to the club and they ended up getting kidnapped. They got roofied and uh, the kid who plays, uh, he's in Dumb and Dumberer. It's like, I hadn't, I haven't really seen him in, <laughs> uh, I think he played Harry. I haven't seen him in that many other things, but he has like a guy like using a drill. He's like drilling into his legs. Uh, he like has a guy like cut his Achilles tendons. So when he stands up, he falls over. Um, I, I, and I actually, they followed him enough to where I cared about the character, uh, and it really bothered me, uh, big time. It, like I was invested and I know Josh and I talked about how in horror movies, if you develop the characters, you know, you'll care. And I actually did care. So Eli Roth did a really good job in making me care about the, the actors in the first hostel. But at the same time, a lot of those scenes were gratuitous and they were, it was, it was torture porn, uh, to me. Uh, it was interesting at the time, but the older I got and the more I look back at it, and even when I watched it for the first time, it just disturbed me. Um, do you guys like Hostel? Did you like it when it came out? Did you change your mind later on? Do you think Eli Roth was crazy for doing that? I mean, was it art or what, was it just crap? Was it torture porn? Leave your thoughts and comments about that film uh, in the comments below, because that's a really... Uh, like device like it splits the audience some people love it or some people can't stand it and it's just torture porn to me i think it's 
it, it's it's got some points. He develops characters. He does a really good job in some areas. Uh, but some of the scenes are just a little gratuitous and unnecessary. And uh, I don't know. As I, I love horror movies because I almost like the fantasy uh, side of it. I like the... I like the like I almost like I suspend belief like it's like a it's almost like sci-fi to me um it's just I don't really go into a movie to see somebody be tortured and just I I I don't really like those sorts of things but you know to each their own um second horror story of the episode the trailer for Scream 6 has been released as well as a look at the new mask and they have a new new movie poster for Scream 6 out so the trailer has been dropped and everybody is, you know, people either love it or they hate it because Ghostface has a shotgun and he's chasing uh, Jenny Ortega and uh, her sister from Scream 5 in this store with a gun. And it looks very uh, school shooterish. It looks like mask, mask murder shooterish shooter thing. Uh, it's not a great look, I don't think. Um, it's really interesting to see uh, Ghostface with a shotgun. Uh, I, I mean, Ghostface in all the previous screen movies uses a gun, uh, but it's always when he has the mask, when he or her is revealed, they later on, they're going to, they're like the James Bond movie villain and they're going to tell their whole evil plot about what they were going to do. Um, (laughs) and I would have got away with it too, if it wasn't for Sydney and that goddamn news reporter and that doofus deputy, um, and that snooping dog, uh. No, I was, but they always do their little monologue and they have the gun, you know, but it's like, just shoot him, shoot him in the head. Let's, let's be done with it. You know, like Austin pa- or <laughs> Dr. Evil's kid, Seth, Seth Green. It's like, just shoot Sydney in the head, shoot Dewey in the head, shoot Gale in the head, game over. Like you won Ghostface. Um, but the audience is divided on this. Should Ghostface have a gun or not? It's like, I, I don't really think so, but you know, half, half of the fun is <laughs> how he's going to get him with his knife. Uh, slash and gash, put another hole in your ass sort of deal. So, I don't know. I did notice that the mask, when they reveal, they show the, a close-up of the mask, it's weathered and older looking. And it kind of reminded me of what they did with the new uh, Michael Myers uh, mask. Uh, it's beat to hell. And it kind of makes me think that they're like the killer could possibly be uh, Stu from the first Scream. Because it's like... Is it the weathered old mask because they're bringing back Stu and he's just beat to shit and he had a TV dropped on his face in the first movie and uh, they're you know what's old what's old is new again and because th- I remember seeing that Stu was supposed to be in Scream Five uh, and that you know Matthew Lillard w- had visited the set of Scream Five but maybe since there was such a quick turnaround they didn't want to drop his ass in Scream Five so they uh, saved him as a surprise entry in the Scream Royal Rumble for <laughs> Scream Six so I would love to see. Uh, Matthew Lillard come back as uh, the ghost face. That'd be great. But who knows? Uh, but maybe Stu's back because of the mask. And also, the Scream movie poster is getting a lot of shit because uh, a lot of people are saying it looks like Avengers Scream. So it's like ghost faces in the middle, uh, kind of like Thanos, and then uh, surrounded by like eight or nine people. You got like Kirby, Hayden Panettiere's back from Scream 4, and then you got Jenny Ortega, and then you've got like Dermal... Dirty Steve Mulroney from Young Guns is on there and New Girl and all these other people. But it just it looked kind of looks like an Avengers or a superhero movie poster and people are pissed. They're like, how come this couldn't be like a 1990s like, you know, scream movie poster where uh, Drew Barrymore is just talking on the phone or like a Pulp Fiction movie poster. But uh, it seems like movie posters are getting lazier and lazier. It's almost like like, oh, I got to put out a movie poster. So we're just going to put out the (laughs) copy, click, paste and put out some bullshit. So I don't know. Uh, let me get, let me know if you guys have seen the new scream, uh, mask or the movie poster and what you guys think about it, put it in the comments below and let me know if you think that uh Ghostface should be using a freaking shotgun when he's chasing down his victims throughout New York. Uh, because a lot of people are pissed off about that. Um, next horror story of the episode, it's been announced that Adrian King who played Alice in the first Friday, the 13th and Friday, the 13th part two will have a reoccurring role in Crystal Lake, the upcoming Peacock series from A24 that serves as a pre-equal to the 1980 horror classic Friday the 13th. And this is by uh, writer Victor Miller. So he he won the rights in court to uh, do this pre-equal 
stuff because he, apparently Miller won the rights to the first movie's script and characters, but not to the hockey mask or because the hockey mask didn't appear until Friday the 13th part three. Uh, and I guess Sean Cunningham is currently in development or uh, in the developmental stages of a Friday the 13th reboot film. So if uh, Sean Cunningham is kind of hoping that uh, Crystal Lake will be successful and that Victor Miller will soften his stands on working with or allowing uh, Sean Cunningham to uh, use the characters from the first movie or whatever, the name Friday the 13th for a reboot film. But if he's not, Sean Cunningham has plan B and he's going to take off uh, from after Friday the 13th part one. So we'll see how that works out. We'll see how Crystal Lake is. If uh, Victor Miller can't use the hockey mask or some of the other stuff, it's like, well, what, is, what is Crystal Lake? I mean, what what is it going to be like? Is it like an anthology? Like, is it an anthology? series is it like a uh, is it like i don't understand what they're going to do because you can you can't it never leads you to jason with the hockey mask is it just going to follow pamela around all the time she's cooking and stuff it's like camp crystal lake and trying to find a babysitter for jason i mean is that the episode i mean what the, she's dealing with the necronomicon i mean we need to get our good friend adam marcus on the show and ask him some questions uh because i have no i have a lot of questions i have no idea where they're going to go with this is it a cash grab i mean i mean it might be good Adrian Adrian's coming back. Uh, they did her absolutely dirty in Friday the 13th Part 2. She survives the entire film, the first film, kills Pamela Voorhees, goes home. Jason somehow is an adult man now, drove a car or took a cab, shows up to her house, uh, and then sticks like a screwdriver through her head. Like, kills her ass. Like, immediately in the opening scene. They, like, did her character so dirty. So at least I'm glad that she's back and she's going to get some uh extra uh run in the franchise but i'm really curious to see what they're going to do with this show because i mean I, will i watch it absolutely what the hell are they going to do with it though because if victor can't if victor miller doesn't have access to the hockey mask i mean where are you is he just gonna be sackhead jason the entire time i have no idea um probably just jason as a child are i are they gonna i don't know is it like young sheldon they're just gonna have young jason <laughs> it's just gonna be jason they're going to show Jason in school and stuff. I don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> Young Jason. That's the name of the show. That's what it should be called. Not fucking Crystal Lake. It's Young Jason. That is, And that's almost as good as the freaking meme I saw the other day of Jason. Uh, not Jason. It was a meme for Jason X. It was uh, Uber Jason. And it was just Jason driving, you know, picking you up for an Uber ride. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, last horror story of the night. Uh, Fred Heads, the documentary, uh, it's about Nightmare on Elm Street, the whole Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. Uh, it's brought to you by some of the biggest Nightmare on Elm Street fans in the world. Uh, my friend Paige Joy, Anthony, Anthony Brownlee, uh, Diandra, La Diandra Laser. Uh, there's a lot, just some of my friends on uh, Instagram, Twitter. They're my friends in real life. Uh, they're doing big things. So Fred Heads, the documentary. Uh, it's the story of how they took on Freddy, uh, the Freddies in their life by taking inspiration from the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. And it's a deep look into all the fans of the Nightmare on Elm Street universe. I, I think it's going to be great. I haven't I haven't been able to see it yet. It's available for pre-order on Amazon right now. And last week, it was number one on the new release section of Amazon. So Paige Joy, my good friend, great friend of the channel, uh, Anthony Brownlee, great friend, personal friend, they're doing big things. I am so excited and happy for them. I just am over the moon to see them have success like this. And I cannot wait to see the film. Uh, if they have a movie release of Fred Heads anywhere near Oregon, I'm going to go. I will absolutely go. I will rent a tuxedo, a green and red tuxedo. And my ass will show up there with a glove, Freddy glove on my hand and 3D glasses on my face. I'm so proud of them. You guys go to Amazon.com right now and pre-order your copy of Fred Heads, the documentary. You will not be disappointed. It's gotten rave reviews. Uh, last week, it was number one on Amazon.com uh, for new releases. So anyway, bravo, Paige and Anthony and Deandra. Just great work. You guys are awesome. Uh, and also, I t you know, I took a lot of inspiration from Paige and Deandra from Elm Street Radio, their, their YouTube channel they had. Um, part of the reason there even is a Slash Tracks news or Slash Tracks reviews or Slash Tracks uh, movie riff uh, show is because of Elm Street Radio. 
I I was inspired by them, and uh, I thought, well, you know what? Maybe I could do something like that someday. So, women in horror, men in horror, they're doing big things. Anything Nightmare on Elm Street related, I'm all about it, especially if they're from my friends. So, get your copy today. Don't wait. Hide your, hide your kids, hide your wife, get your ass over there. Act like you're the little kid who loves corn, and the copy of Fred Heads is corn. It's, it's the most beautiful thing ever, okay? It's got the juice, baby. Go get it. Let's get into Slash Tracks headlines. So we're getting in headlines to end the show. This thing is just flying by. Uh, I miss Josh, though. I miss my buddy. I can't wait till Josh is. I can't wait till Josh is back in my co-pilot seat right here. Miss you, Josh. Get better, pal. All right. First headline of the night: Singer Shakira found out her partner Gerard Peake was cheating on her after she noticed someone ate her strawberry jam. So her hips don't lie, and strawberry jam doesn't lie either. Uh, Strawberry jam today. Oh, who ate my strawberry jam? So Shakira ended the 11-year relationship after she found out that the jam she had been, or the, the strawberry jam she had in the fridge had been eaten. So Shakira was thinking that Gerard was creeping before, apparently, and the strawberry jam just put it over the top and was a nail in the coffin for old Gerard. Because her, their kids don't eat strawberry jam, and neither did Gerard. So the only other person who could have eaten it was the person who was sleeping with Gerard, apparently, to Shakira. So she ended the relationship because somebody ate her strawberry jam. I don't know if there's a follow-up uh, to this story. I don't know if it was proven in a court of law that some, somebody other than uh, you know the alleged adulteress ate uh, said strawberry jam. I would love to know how this ended. But they're not together anymore. And uh, I, I, would this even hold up in court? I mean, how does this work? It's like, well, I think somebody uh, ate my strawberry jam because no one else in the house likes it. So it had to be that whore over there. I mean, how does that work? Like, that story is just nuts, man. Um, what I talked about earlier in the episode, I'm just going to go over this briefly. Story number two uh, of headlines. Netflix is releasing Mighty Morphin Power Rangers once and always. Uh, the 30-year anniversary of the Power Rangers David Yost and Walter Jones, uh, the black and blue original Rangers, the OGs, are both returning, along with the second Red Ranger, Steve Cardonis, uh, the second Pink Ranger, Catherine Sutherland, the second Yellow Ranger, Karen Ashley, and the second Black Ranger, Johnny Young Bosch. Uh, unfortunately, there's not going to be any Jason David Frank, at least that I know of. I don't know if he was able to film anything before his passing. I was really looking forward to that. Um, no Austin St. John because he's dealing with legal battle battles and, uh, you know, no original yellow Ranger, no Trini because she unfortunately passed away many years ago, but apparently there's going to be Trini's daughter is going to be, uh, in the show. So I don't know if she's going to have the yellow Ranger powers passed to her. I don't know how that's going to work. Maybe she'll be a different color. I don't know. Um, I saw a preview where there was a green Ranger. So is Johnny Young Bosch going to be the green Ranger? Cause they're going to have they're not going to have two Black Rangers because Walter Jones is back. So how's, how does that work? I don't know. But I'm looking forward to seeing it. So big Power Ranger fan here. Uh, you guys know that already. Huge nerd, toy collector. Got a lot of Power Rangers for Christmas. I got the head flippers uh, from my girlfriend, Nicole. Uh, super excited about that. Uh, just love the Power Rangers. Uh, helped me get through a really tough and turbulent childhood. And I'm really looking forward to seeing that. And I think uh, media in general, I mean, it doesn't have to be Power Rangers. It could be whatever it is for you, whatever you like, whatever helps you uh, make your life a little bit easier and a little bit more fun. If it's not hurting, if it's not hurting anybody, that's awesome. So if anybody says anything to you about like, oh, you shouldn't like this or, or you're too old for that, it's like, go fuck yourself. Like, I'll like whatever I like and I'll do whatever I want to do because I'm a goddamn peacock and I'm going to fly. If you're not hurting anybody. Shut up. Leave me alone. Uh, Third headline of the night, Gabrielle Union. So she was a star of Bring It On. She was in, uh, God, she's been in a bunch of stuff. Uh, she was in Bad Boys 2. She was the one who was dating uh, Will Smith. Gabrielle Union says she felt comfortable with cheating on her first husband since she paid all the bills. So a lot of thoughts here. So Gabrielle Union said she felt comfortable cheating on her first husband because she paid the bills. Okay, that's ridiculous number one number two this poor husband uh did he pay any bills at all in the house or was he just a house husband how how did this work out did he know she was cheating on him did they have this conversation was he cool with it or did he find out 
she was cheating on him and she just said, listen, I pay the bills, like it or leave it. Um, if a guy said that, if a guy said, I felt comfortable cheating on my wife because I pay all the bills, do you realize how much uh, clap back and how much uh, bullshit that would stir up uh, in the tw Twitter, Twitterverse and Instagram and Facebook? That would be nationwide news, but it's a, a beautiful female, so it's like s completely swept under the rug. Nobody cares. Uh, I think it's ridiculous. I think you're if you're married, you're married. Um, you're a team, and you're in it together. So if you, her saying that, she's just using that as an excuse to to get her tricks on the side. I feel bad for the first husband. I think it's ridiculous, and I think her new husband, you know, NBA former NBA superstar Dwayne Wade, better be on the. You better be lightly stepping around her and he better not slip up on any mortgage payments or any anything, because if he slips up and doesn't pay his part, she's going to be creeping around late last night instead of two something that's going to be <laughs> two in the moonlight. Can you feel me in? Craig David's going to be around. Why were you creeping around late last night instead of two something something in the pale moonlight? Can you feel me in? <laughs> I mean, come on, man. That's not a woman that you want to not pay your half of the bills uh, with because she will start creeping, son. Uh, it's in print. She admits it. Okay. Done deal. Let's get into <laughs> what else do I have here? Let's. How do you follow that story? All right. I think I have two headlines left and that's the end of the show. So <laughs> next headline. This is a really good one. And this, this, is, this is heartwarming. Texas dad sold his business and spent $51 million to build an amusement park for his daughter and other special needs children. So Gordon Hartman sold his business and built a $51 million inclusive amusement park for his disabled daughter, Margot. When he realized there was no amusement parks where his daughter and others uh, with, dis with disabilities could play, he decided to design and build one himself. The park is 25 acres and it's called Morgan's Wonderland. And it's the world's first ever uh, ultra accessible theme park and offers free entry to all those with special needs and disabilities. So Gordon is a hero. This is amazing. He saw a need. He had the financial uh, ability to, to fill it. And he made it happen. He, this guy is a hero. He didn't just help his daughter. His love for his daughter uh, propelled him to do this. But he helped so many other uh, kids that wouldn't have uh, had a chance to go to an amusement park and have a blast and to not worry about their problems for at least one day. Um, sometimes that's all you need is just one, one day away from your bullshit to enjoy your life. And Gordon is an absolute hero. Um, he's the slash tracks hero of the episode. He's the slash tracks hero of the week. So Gordon, if you're watching this episode, which you're probably not, uh, I applaud you big time. And I'm, if Josh was here, I'm sure he would do the same thing. So Gordon Hartman, you're the slash tracks hero of the week. You have made the lives of children all over the world better. So good for you. Let's get into the last. Uh, let's get into the last story of the night, and then we're gonna end that. We're gonna end this sucker. That's good to be back. Chicago man arrested after handing out marijuana marijuana gummies on Halloween. I don't know how I didn't find this story until now. Halloween was a couple months ago. Uh, he claimed he ran out of regular candies, so he decided he was going to start handing out the marijuana gummies. Uh, Jared Falain, it's uh, spelled F-E-I-L-E-N, so Falain is now a felon, uh, 25 years old, was identified as the man who handed out an unknown number of weed gummy bear bags. Uh, a parent <laughs> and some grandparents of children who had gotten some of the laced gummies noticed the familiar smell and immediately went to the authorities and uh, voice their concerns. So Feline is now being charged with five counts of child endangerment. So this guy was trying to be a good person and uh, still, you know, keep Halloween going and hand out marijuana edibles. But uh, he handed it out to some snitches and now he's busted big time. Yeah. In the words of Pauly D. Uh, so he's probably going to go to jail. Um, he's out of his weed edibles. So that's a bummer. Everybody, he's, he's a felon now. He's going to be a felon uh, if he's convicted. So that's a bummer. Everything bad about, everything about this story is bad for this poor guy. And he was just trying to do something nice, even though he's a moron. What he should have did was put pause on whatever Halloween movie he was watching and walked his ass down to the store and bought some more candy. Or maybe just prepped beforehand. Or maybe not gotten high and then decided to hand out more <laughs> candy for other people to get high. 
I have no idea. That's the end of the show. Uh, guys, be excellent to each other. May the power protect you always. And as Josh always tells me to say, good night, Alex and Mahalo Dogs. We'll see you on the next episode. Be on the lookout for the next episode of Slash Tracks where we riff and tear apart uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, the remake 2009. It's good to be back. Can't wait to be back with Josh. Have a good night, guys. <laughs>